there was very, very little online. And uh, what there was was quite difficult to find, wasn't always indexed. And I'm very pleased to say that things have got an awful lot easier. Now, you might think, why on earth would you want to go to the National Archives in England to find out about your Irish ancestry? Well, we're not the first place you should go. When you're doing family history, everybody knows you should start at home. And then you probably want to look at things like births, marriages and deaths, parish records, wills and census returns. Well, we don't have any of those for Ireland. And unfortunately, they don't always survive even in Ireland itself. Uh, but the records that do survive are a lot more accessible than they were when I started doing family history myself. Um, and I have to declare an interest here because about a third of my ancestors are Irish. And uh, it's very nice to be able to find out something about them, although I, I still have a long way to go. So we're not the very first place you should come to, to look at the what you call vital records and so on. Um, and I have put on the uh, accompanying document, which is just a page of links, really, uh, just a few links to places where you would start your Irish research, where you can find out about the basics. But then, as I said before, why would you come to the National Archives here in England? Well, well the National Archives of where exactly, as I often describe us? We're, um, the archives for England, with the archives for Wales most of the time, we're also the National Archives for the United Kingdom. And it really does depend on which set of records we're talking about, whether it's an English, English and Welsh set, or a United Kingdom set. And the United Kingdom sometimes included Ireland. Less than a century ago, the Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom. And you have to bear this in mind when you're looking at records for your Irish ancestors. So we have um, an awful lot of records which are about Ireland. First of all, we've got some records which are very obviously Irish. It's in the title and in the description. But we have an awful lot more records which were in very general UK-wide series that happen to contain a lot of really useful Irish material. And we've also got a, a couple of sets of records which look Irish, but they're not very Irish at all, uh, which pleases me a bit. Um, I'm going to start just by outlining the records, the general records that have got Irish content, and much the biggest of those are the records for the armed forces. So if you had an Irish ancestor in the army or the navy and so on, that was the British army, it was the Royal Navy. So uh, we've probably got some records. And of course, at any given time, a very high proportion of men in the British Army were Irish or had Irish birthplaces or had some association with Ireland. And one of the things that strikes me particularly uh, is just how much people moved around within the United Kingdom. Um, it's, it, this is incidental to this talk, but if you have, if like me, you have not of Northern Irish ancestry, there's a very good chance that you've also got Scottish ancestry. If you look on a map, on a proper accurate modern one, not this beautiful one on the screen, um, the distance between the coast of Northern Ireland and the southwest coast of Scotland is very, very uh, narrow indeed, and people moved back and forth a lot. So although I can't expand on Scottish records, uh, it is worth bearing in mind that your Irish ancestors might have come and gone a lot between uh, the northern part of Ireland not just modern day Northern Ireland, but other Northern counties, uh, particularly County Donegal. Uh, so it's worth looking in Scottish records as well. We've also got records as well as the armed forces and other services, uh, which are non-military UK wide services. The Home Office has got an enormous amount of information in its records about Ireland and the Irish for a whole variety of reasons. Um, the Irish population, particularly in the 19th and early 20th centuries, was incredibly heavily scrutinised. A lot of people uh, were very interested um, in what the Irish were getting up to. Um, and the Home Office records have got huge amounts in there. Some of it is of great genealogical interest. Some of it is more general and background, but there is an awful lot there. Probate records are something that you might not think of. 
um, because the records that we hold are basically English and Welsh, but a probate record, whether it's a will or an administration, will depend on where a person had property. And when you're talking about Anglo-Irish families who went back and forth between uh, England and Ireland, you might find people that were pretty much settled in Ireland, uh, they might have their will um, in an, an English court, particularly the PCC. That's the prerogative court at Canterbury. And also, um, anyone who died overseas, and this includes, of course, lots of sailors and soldiers, um, their wills were automatically proved in the PCC. So there are all sorts of reasons why your Irish ancestor, if they left a will or letters of administration, they might be um, in the records that we hold here. Migration records um, are another very fruitful source. What we don't have, uh, and we're often asked about this, is records of um, migration from Ireland into England. Um, where can I find the passenger list where my Irish ancestors came to England? Well, you won't find them. Um, I sometimes facetiously said the same place as the passenger list of the tube train that you came here on because this was just internal migration. It was people moving around within the one country, the United Kingdom. And anyway, before the First World War, most countries weren't that bothered uh, about borders anyway. So you're not going to find very much, if anything, about ancestors moving from Ireland to other parts of the UK. Uh, but what you will find are records of your Irish ancestors leaving the UK and heading for Australia, America, uh, or anywhere else, um, sometimes willingly and sometimes not. So for migration records, it's really emigration from the United Kingdom, not Irish people moving into um, England, Wales, or Scotland. The very specifically Irish records that we have are the records of the Royal Irish Constabulary. There are only two police forces where we hold the records. Uh, because both of them came under the um, jurisdiction of the Home Office. One of them is the London Metropolitan Police and the other is the Royal Irish Constabulary. And although I'm going to say a bit more about the Royal Irish Constabulary, it's also worth mentioning that, um, bearing in mind that I said lots of people moved a lot within the UK, your Irish ancestors who moved into England, Wales or Scotland you won't find migration records, but you will find them turning up and you will find them doing jobs, very often jobs that nobody else wanted. And the police was one of those. So um, although I'm not going to enlarge on it, it's worth remembering that the, uh, the Metrop London Metropolitan Police did have a lot of Irishmen in it. But I'll come back to the uh, Royal Irish Constabulary. There's also another very Irish set of records, which is called the Irish Reproductive Loan Fund, insert own joke here. but. Um, this is a, a something which is, is given, it's been given a different title uh, since it's gone online. And again, I will show you uh, examples of that later. But this is a, a wonderful set of records where you'll find little bits of information about people quite low down the social scale. These are not people who left wills, who had masses of property. These are very ordinary people. And this is an absolutely terrific resource. There is also something called the Irish so Sailors and Soldiers Land Trust which uh, again, I'm not going to enlarge on that very much. Um, there really isn't time to cover all the record series that I would like to, but this is uh, really is a 20th century record. And best way to find out about that, because we don't have a dedicated guide on it, is to just, just search um, for, for that, as, use that as a search term uh, and search discovery our catalog and you will find them. They're, they're in the, the Dominion's office record, record series DO. Um, and uh, that you may find something interesting there. But these are 20th century records, so they're not uh, very helpful for you going back and back in, in, uh, in your Irish family. Um, another really huge series is what's called the Dublin Castle Records. And this is another example of the English authorities being terribly interested in what the Irish were up to. And the Dublin Castle Records, uh, which cover a number of series, these are all about the administration of um, British rule in Ireland. In 1801, Ireland lost its own parliament, uh, and that's really when the United Kingdom uh, began in a way. Uh, there was the union of the, uh, the, the Scottish and English parliaments, 
about a century earlier, but from 1801, that's when it, it was the United Kingdom of the whole of the British Islands. Um, so because there was no Irish Parliament, it was the Dublin Castle uh, was where um, Ireland was ruled from there, and there's a tremendous amount of information in there. Again, some of it's very name rich, some of it is just background. And I'm very pleased to say that some of these records are now online. And others which aren't online um, have been uh, catalogued in quite some detail. So you may be able to identify a record and then ask us to give you a copy of it. Now, the biggest record as a set of records, as I mentioned, is uh, service records. And there have always been lots of Irishmen and later women uh, in the British Army. Huge numbers. Uh, nobody knows the exact proportion. But now that uh, a lot of military records have been indexed and digitized on online, you can just look at the birthplaces uh, and get a pretty good idea. And it's very important to remember that they weren't always in Irish regiments. Um, the, the British Army was absolutely enormous. At any given time, a lot of it would be at barracks in England, a lot would be at barracks in uh, Ireland. And in fact, there were two different um, establishments. There was Chelsea Hospital, uh, which administered the uh, records and pension records for most of the British Army. But uh, there used to be the Kilmainham establishment as well, which was the administrative headquarters of the army in Ireland. But again, that was not necessarily Irish records or Irish men. It was just the administration relating to regiments that happened to be in Ireland at the time. So don't think that uh, your Irish ancestor is going to be in one of the Irish regiments. They might be, but they might easily be um, in others. I've got Irish ancestors who uh, cover both extremes. I've got one who was in the, uh, the, the East Kent Regiment, known as the Buffs, 3rd Regiment of Foot. And I've got another one who was in a Highland Regiment. So um, you can get about as far north as you can get and about as far south as you can get. And I've got Irish ancestors in both of those. And if you look, you might well find that you have too. So don't just think Irish regiments, think any uh, regional uh, county regiment. And of course, things like the Royal Artillery and the Royal Engineers and various other corps. For army records, um, We've got lots and lots of guides. So rather than go into a lot of detail about army records, which are very well covered elsewhere, I've just given you a link to all the guides that we have relating to army records. If you go into our uh, list of research guides and select the family history section, you'll find we've got at last count to 209 guides. Now you can filter this down, which I've done on the, the screen that you see there. I've just clicked the box army and militia and that narrows it down to 28 guides and all 28 of those guides will have information in there that may be of use to you if you've got an Irish ancestor in the British army or in the militia. So I do encourage you to go and look at the guides uh, that cover the period, the type of soldier that you're interested in and you will find uh, a lot of it useful information in there, some of it very detailed. If uh, th this is just an example, because I've, I've kept you hanging on long enough without showing you some actual documents. This is an example. In fact, it is my own ancestor. I don't get very many chances to do this, but this is my uh, great, great, I've lost count of how many. William Charlton, who was a private in the 74th Regiment uh, in 1812. And in fact, that's when he was invalided out. And this is a record of his pension. Um, I've um, th These records are bound into books. And in fact, what you're seeing here is on the left hand side is the front page and on the right hand side is the reverse of the same page. Um, so I've, I've, I've cut and pasted that so you can see the whole of the record for him. Records at this period are not terrifically informative, but it does tell me exactly where in Ireland he was born, which was something I didn't think I was going to be able to find out because um, we had the decency to live on until 1851. So it was in the 1851 census. Um, but unfortunately, he's in the 1851 census in Scotland, um, and he didn't manage to hang on until the civil registration started in Scotland in 1855. So I would have had a wonderful death certificate for him then. Um, he, he pegged out in 1854, so um, I don't get a lot of information from his death certificate, but I have been able to find out quite a lot through um, his army records. And again, 
this is just one document that I found, but if you go through uh, and look at the various guides, and they will direct you to things like muster rolls as well as actual service and pension records. So you'll be surprised sometimes at just how much you can find out uh, about the soldier. Um, so it's, it's often better to, to have a, an Irish ancestor who was a soldier than anything else because uh, the army's always been pretty well recorded. Now, that's just one example. And I said this record doesn't have an awful lot on it, but the more recent the records are, uh, the more detailed they're likely to be. Now, I've just picked a couple of examples here. One of them is very distantly related to me, and one of them isn't, and it really doesn't matter. It's just to show you that these are the kind of records that you might find a little bit later on. Um, you'd see from the references, these are in the record series W097, which is what is commonly known as soldiers' documents. And this is the, the big, big record series that we have. Um, when these were digitized, they were, I think, pretty much on the point of being removed from uh, from service because they were getting so um, heavily handled. So it was, a, it was a great thing that they were digitized because if they hadn't been, you might never have been able to see them at all. You can see these without reading them. You're not going to be able to read the detail, but you can see there's quite a lot of information there. Now, the one on the left, uh, who was born in Ireland, and if you work out his date of birth, he was born in Ireland before civil registration started in Ireland. And that, that was very late, that was 1864. So if you've got a soldier service record for someone born in Ireland before 1864, that is going to be your best chance of finding birthplaces and sometimes family information. The one on the right is a bit more recent still, uh, and this one is actually a Scotsman, born in Edinburgh. So you might wonder why I've put him there. Well, I have got a reason. But first of all, this is from um, the, the uh, just a, an example from the rest of the record for the first man that I showed you there, uh, the Irishman. And this uh, gives you the summary of his service, where he served and when, which is very nice. Uh, but it also uh, gives you some details about his family. Bearing in mind this is someone that you won't have a birth certificate for because he was uh, born in Ireland and you may have difficulty tracking down a baptism. Um, this gives you the names of his parents and also that he'd got a couple of younger brothers. And in fact, I picked him pretty much at random, but if you were interested in this person, um, you would be able to hopefully find the birth certificates of um, one or other of his brothers. Although, since the army record very kindly gives you the names of his parents, um, you might not even need to do that. So that's one uh, example of the sort of supplementary information you get about people other than the soldier himself. Now this other one, and this is the one that I have very distantly related to, this man was from Scotland, but his wife was Irish. And here it gives his address, but it also gives you the name of his uh, Irish wife, Honor Lynch, which is a good Irish name, gives you the date and place of their marriage in Dublin, and also the dates and places of birth of their children. And two of them were born in Ireland, and the third one um, you're really struggling to find that one, was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, so when you get a record, it's always worth looking through the whole of the record uh, for all sorts of clues, especially where it gives you bits of family information. As I said, this tends to be on the later rather than the earlier records, uh, but it's always worth looking. Um, and before we leave the army altogether, it's not just the regular army. There are also We also have records of uh, militia and they, these are very similar kinds of records uh, and this is just uh, an example of one of those and again you will often find these uh, men in Ireland or with Irish birthplaces uh, who were born before the start of civil registration so you, you can often find uh, lots of information on an army record so even if your direct ancestor wasn't uh, in the army it might be worth having a look around to see if there was um, anyone who might be related to him, um, you can search these records online. They're on um, Find My Past, and they're also now on um, a site called Fold3, which belongs to Ancestry. And you can search, you can search by name, but you can also search by places, place of birth and so on. So uh, it's worth exploring. Don't just go head on and look for, I am looking for this individual and I'm only going to do name searches. It's often worth 
having a, a wider look around and see if you can find people who are associated with them. And before I leave the army altogether, uh, not forgetting uh, the women's services. Uh, from the First World War, you begin to get records of women in the armed services generally. Um, unfortunately, rather like the men's records for the First World War, lots of the service records for women don't survive. But when they do survive, uh, particularly for the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, you do get an awful lot of detail. And bearing in mind if this is your parent or grandparent, um, you sometimes get what I consider an unnecessary amount of gynecological detail, but there you go. Um, so the, these are well worth looking at. But not everything is, is the army. The army is much the biggest force, but of course there are other armed forces. There's the Royal Navy, and the Royal Navy includes um, other organisations, the Royal Navy Division, which was people who wanted to join the Navy in the First World War, uh, but the Navy didn't quite have enough ships yet, so uh, they were a land-based force, but they were part of the Navy. And then there were the Royal Naval Reserve and the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve, and there are separate sets of records for all of these, and they are mostly um, digitized and indexed. They're part of digital downloads on our own website, and some of the records are available on other sites too. And then there's the Royal Marines, which is a smaller force again. And the Royal Marines, although they are their records are administered by the Admiralty, they are absolutely not part of the Navy. They are The Royal Marines were fighting men who happened to be based on ships. Um, and again, it, it's very easy to forget. You think, oh, there's the army. And there were so many people in the army. If you had an ancestor who served in the forces, it's not necessarily the army. It's always worth looking for the other forces as well. And of course, much more recently, uh, the Royal Air Force, which only came into existence on the 1st of April, 1918. But before that, uh, there was the Royal Flying Corps, which is part of the Army, and the Royal Naval Air Service, which was part of the Navy. Um, the odd thing about the records is that if someone was in the Royal Naval Air Service, um, and they carried on serving in the Royal, Royal Air Force after the 1st of April, you will find a record for them in the Royal Flying Corps records, and you will also find a record in the Royal Navy records. If they were in the Royal Flying Corps, you'll only find a Royal Air Force record. You won't find a service record for them in the Army, although you may find a medal card. It's just one of those interesting little quirks. It's just the way things um, are arranged. It's the way the Admiralty, the Royal Navy, um, and, and, the, you know, and the, the Army and the Air Force. It's just the, the different ways that they chose to keep their records. And I mentioned the um, the Royal, this is a Royal Navy ratings record. Um, they don't give you as much detail as you'll get in Army records, which often run to several pages. But it still get, does give you pretty good detail. You don't know get information about family, but you will get a date of birth, which might be accurate. The day and the month are usually right, although sometimes they lied about their age. Um, but it does give you the birthplace and a summary of service. So um, that uh, they're pretty good records, and you get details about tattoos and scars and things. And then the Royal Naval Division that I mentioned, these are very, very brief records. They're literally just cards. But again, there's quite a lot of information packed into that. This one is someone um, got a nice Irish name, Michael Patrick Murphy, uh, and he lived. His address was in Plymouth, but his next of kin, his father, um, not surprisingly, lived in Ireland. So uh, they are uh, very nice and searchable. Again, they're on uh, National Archives website. This is an example of a record which is not online. But it's like many records we have, particularly in the, on the military side, where um, records have been catalogued in quite a lot of detail. Uh, this one is uh, part of the applications for children to join the Royal, uh, the, the Greenwich Hospital School, which was a, effectively a charity school for the children of sailors, um, usually Royal Navy or Royal Marines but also some uh, merchant uh, sailors' children. And they were usually orphans or the families were in poor circumstances. And the records are very variable. They are literally bundles of paper. Some of them have only got one or two pages. Some of them have got about 15. 
but um, these have been the, the result, the subject of a wonderful cataloging project. And the information that's been extracted, where possible, gives you the, uh, the, the date of birth and sometimes the place of birth of the child who's uh, applying, uh, but also the date and place of the parent's marriage. And lots and lots of these uh, marriages took place in Ireland, and so did some of the births and baptisms. So that's um, a, a lot of detail there. I picked this one out because not only does it give you uh, her date of birth and the fact that her parents married in Dublin, um, but it also has the additional note that she was invited to attend the school, um, but the letter came back um, undelivered because the family had returned to Dublin. Well, there's not many records that give you that level of detail. So this is another series that's worth having a look at. A lot of the children who applied weren't accepted. Uh, if they were accepted, then you can go and follow this up and look at the records of the Royal Hospital School itself. But it's another uh, rather little known source uh, that is well worth looking. It's just one example of a number of uh, Navy records in particular where we've, they've been indexed by, by name in a lot of detail. Um, so you can tell that you can't download this because um, instead of a, a button that says download now, it says order now, and that means you can order a copy of that um, through our record copying service. Or if you're on site here at the National Archives and you've got a reader's ticket, you can order the thing up and look at all the bits of paper in the box yourself. That's a very brief run through the, the armed forces. Um, but of course, I, there are various non-military services, which I alluded to. There is the Merchant Navy, of course, and uh, a lot of British people, whether they're mainland British or Irish, have got ancestors in the Merchant Navy. And these people have always been very tricky uh, to research, mainly because of the way that Merchant Navy records were kept. And if they also happen to be Irish, that's, uh, that, that just adds to the problems. But um, as with Irish records, generally, I'm very pleased to say that such records as survive for merchant seamen, um, a lot of them have been indexed and digitized. So searching for your merchant navy ancestor, who also happens to be Irish, has become a lot easier than it used to be. Um, then there are other services like the Coast Guard. And this was very much a UK-wide service. It was one of those services uh, which, being a, a, a kind of policing organization, the um, authorities um, made a particular point of moving people around because as a Coast Guard, you would be policing um, people, the people you live with. And what they did not want was having people trying to police their near relatives. So if, if someone was in the Coast Guard, they would, they would absolutely not be in the place where they came from. So they could be very difficult to find. Uh, but we have got quite good records of the Coast Guard. They're not incredibly detailed. You don't get the, the level of detail that the through service records for one man that you get with the Army um, or even for the Navy. Uh, they tend to be uh, just lists of postings. But you can follow someone, someone's career. Uh, they tend to be uh, just lists of postings. But you can follow someone, someone's career as they moved around through the coasts of um, England, Wales, Scotland, um, Ireland, and the Isle of Man comes back. Now, the Coast Guard records, unlike the Army and some of the Merchant Navy and other military service records, they're not indexed online, but they are online. I can remember many years ago researching a Coast Guard and tracking him through um, using a research guide and looking in this record to find an index and then working out what document I needed to look at next. And I was doing all of this, I think, before the records had even been microfilmed. I distinctly remember looking at some books. Then the records were microfilmed, which made it a little bit easier. And now the microfilm itself has been digitized. It's not indexed by name, but you can do exactly what I did many years ago uh, without doing what I did and going to Chancery Lane as it then was and looking up things in catalogues and looking at books and then working out the next thing. You can do the whole of that process. You can do it all online. You've still got to look through pages and scan through alphabets. Um, but instead of looking at books or going getting a roll of microfilm out, 
you can download um, the, a, a digital version of the, the, the microfilm. It's called digital microfilm and it's free to download because it hasn't had um, enhanced indexing. And if you look at the research guide about Coast Guards, um, you can follow the instructions and you can do it all online. And I know it works because I absolutely retraced the steps that I did to find the co the, my Coast Guard ancestor. Um, however many, about probably about 25 years ago, I repeated the process much more recently and it worked and I could do it without, without getting up off my seat. Customs and excise in many ways is very similar. The same principle applies that people were moved around so that they were not policing their near relatives. And like the Coast Guard, we have records which are mainly establishment lists or notices of appointment. Uh, so it, it's, it, that can involve quite a lot of research, but you can piece together someone's career in the customs and or excise service. A very few of those records are actually online, uh, so there's a limited amount that you can do. Um, and they are actually Irish records, specifically Irish records. So um, things are looking up. And then again, there is the Royal Irish Constabulary, which I've already mentioned and which I will come back to, I promise, and I will show you some um, examples. Now, I mentioned the Merchant Navy, and this is just one example of many uh, kinds of records. Um, it's, a, it's a medal card from the First World War. Unfortunately, Merchant Navy records, um, the quite good records for the 1830s to 1850s, and then there was a great big gap before the, there was a next attempt at a central registry, and that doesn't really start until 1918. Um, so my Merchant Navy ancestor, who died in 1917, I can get very limited information about him, but I have got his medal card, so that's something, and it does tell me that he was born about 1855 and in County Tyrone. Um, I can't get any narrower than that, but that's, that, that's something, I suppose. But a connected set of records, which are not specifically to do with the Merchant Navy, um, is, is lots and lots of collections of records of deaths at sea. This particular one um, is actually from an Admiralty record. You can see from the, the reference ADM. Uh, so this is for Royal Navy ships. Um, there are lots and lots of different records. Some of them are for merchant ships, others for Royal Navy ships. Deaths at sea, and come to that births at sea, there are a number of places where they might be recorded, if they're recorded at all. Uh, sometimes you will find nothing. Uh, but um, some of the deaths at sea records are quite detailed. And this is quite a nice one. I picked this particular page because it gives the home addresses of um, the, these, these men who died in, on Royal Navy ships. And I think about three of them on this page uh, have got Irish addresses. Um, sometimes that might be the first um, inkling that your ancestor was Irish. So uh, uh, people are always finding Irish ancestors that they didn't know they had. Uh, so if you've got someone who is in either the Merchant Navy or the Royal Navy, or you think might just have been on a ship for some reason, if they were Irish um, and they had the misfortune to die on that ship, um, it's worth looking in some of these records. Again, a lot of them are now online on uh, a number of different websites. If you look at our guide on uh, first marriages and deaths at sea and, over, and, and abroad, uh, that will give you some uh, ideas of where to look. Customs and excise, I mentioned. Uh, this is uh, the, quite a number of different sets of records. And the Irish records, the, like, um, as you can see on these points here, there was a separate Irish establishment, um, 1807 to 1823. And there are some uh, records within the series which are very specifically described as Irish. Uh, and then Irish excise men, 1824 to 1833. And this is the record series, Irish Revenue Police, 1830 to 1857. That set of records is online uh, and it's on uh, Find My Past. And that's Find My Past Ireland because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a rec it's an Irish record series. And again, uh, for people, for customs and excise generally, um, they were eventually united. Uh, there are establishment lists for inland revenue staff. Um, that's a fairly general guide, but I just wanted to put some of those details in there just to show you what a variety of records we have got for uh, customs and excise staff, even though they're not fantastically detailed on the whole. 
Um, there is quite a lot there that you can find and it does involve a lot, of, a lot of on the ground research, but there's some stuff online, which is, which is good to know. Now the Royal Irish Constabulary, and I'm very, very pleased with these ones because um, this has been a long, long time coming. Uh, but finally, the Royal Irish Constabulary Service Records, which are quite heavily used here at the National Archives, they have finally gone online. It was only a few days ago. And um, although I've given you a link to our guide about Royal Irish Constabulary, when you look at it, it may not have the updated version, but it, it will be there very soon. Um, anyone who's ever tried to use these records will know that they'd have had to uh, come here to the National Archives and um, we, we had a book where you could look up people by number and then you had to work out which the role of horrible microfilm that service number was on and then look at the microfilm and try to see whether you could read it. Um, I was just thrilled to see these online because like many projects that have um, gone online in recent years, instead of digitising from the microfilm, uh, these have gone back to the original records, which of course are of vastly better quality. And you can really look at them and you can zoom in and you can read them. And um, there's a, I, I'm interested in family history. And I realised I'm not just interested in my own family, I'm just nosy and I'm very interested in everyone's family. And I like to look at these things and see patterns and see where people got moved to. And again, because it was a police force, people got moved around so that they were not policing where they came from or where their wife came from. So if you look at all the columns on there, um, you can see how people were moved around Ireland. And uh, just to make life more exciting, not all of the recruits were Irish. You do get people from mainland Britain who were in the Royal Irish Constabulary as well. The um, service records, which are very, very newly online, they're on Find My Past Ireland, as are the pension records, which is a much smaller series. And the pension records, they're also on Ancestry as well. Uh, I haven't got into a lot of detail about exactly what is on which site, because that can get quite complicated. Um, what I usually advise people to do is look on the, the, the websites, particularly if you're a subscriber, and see what uh, what new records they've got. Look at their, um, on a Find My Past, it's called the A to Z list. On, uh, the, on Ancestry, it's called the Card Catalogue. And you can, you, you can sort your results by different ways. But uh, that's a good way of keeping up with what's going online. You can also look... Um, at our research guides and very often at Discovery, our catalogue, uh, where if a record set is online, Discovery will usually tell you that. Uh, that's something that we started to do comparatively recently, and it's not, you know, it's not absolutely 100%. Um, so don't, if something, is, something might be online and uh, the, the link hasn't been up, up, upgraded on Discovery yet, but it's a pretty good indication. So there are lots of ways of finding out if something is, is online. So that's the Royal Constabulary, Royal Irish Constabulary, which I'm extremely happy about. Uh, not that I found any of my own family in it, but I just like to know it's there. I mentioned earlier on migration, and uh, this is um, an outgoing passenger list. We have passenger lists from 1890 to 1960, that's out, this is an outgoing one. We also have incoming ones. Unfortunately, they weren't systematically kept before then, uh, although you will often find uh, passenger lists in the destination countries. So if you had Irish family who went to um, the United States or Canada, they have incoming passenger lists at their end, which start much earlier. Uh, but the outgoing passenger lists um, are quite interesting to look at. And if someone moved, um, between those years, 1890 to 1960, you, uh, you might find them there. You might also find people um, going back and forth across the Atlantic. Now that these records um, are accessible and very easy to search, uh, it's quite interesting how often you can find a particular person. If you have someone with a very distinctive name, they're very easy to spot. Uh, but an awful lot of people might emigrate, go back and visit family, or go abroad, work for a few years, and then come home. Um, so there's there's an awful lot of toing and froing. Migration is uh, not always just a, a simple one-way, once and for all process. Um, and I'm, as an incidental, um, with, with what I mentioned about the Merchant Navy earlier on, 
although you won't find merchant navy uh, personnel on the whole mentioned in passenger lists sometimes you will you will get them uh, if they were merchant seamen who were abroad and were sort of hitching a lift back on a merchant vessel you will sometimes see them um, listed at the end of the passenger list so if you've got a merchant seaman uh, particularly if it's got a reasonably distinctive name it's worth searching for him in the passenger list because you might find him uh, popping up uh, where you weren't really expecting him to and I, I've certainly done that so that's a, an outgoing passenger list and then it does look remarkably similar that there's an incoming passenger list something that's often worth looking for on passenger lists um, is to see what their final uh, destination country was. You don't get this on every passenger list, but in an awful lot of them, you'll see on the right hand side, um, there will often be a column to tick whether they were from um, England, Wales, Ireland or Scotland and la country of last permanent residence and then country of intended um, future residence. And it's very obvious when you look at some of these that if you have a, an Irish person who has gone to America, and they come back and you find them on an incoming passenger list. If, you, if it's one of those that's got that sort of detail, it will tell you uh, whether they're just on a visit because their um, country of, in, of intended residence is back in America, or whether they've had enough of America or Australia, thank you very much, and they're coming home. So that's something to look for. You get very, you can get very excited about, oh, there's the person, there's their name, there's their age, there's the family. If there's extra information, it's worth looking. Now, another big area um, which I, I mentioned earlier is that the Home Office and the British authorities in general are terribly interested in what the Irish are up to. And law and order, although it's largely a local business, if someone was convicted of a crime in Ireland, uh, then they would be tried in an Irish court and they would serve their sentence or their punishment there. But if they did something that was bad enough to cause them to be transported, the transportation records, they, um, the transportation always went from um, England. So someone might be convicted in an Irish court that you will find a record to do with their transportation in um, home office records, or um, as you can see here, also in uh, admiralty records in some cases, because before they were transported, convicts were left sometimes for very, very long periods on prison hulks, which were just horrible, great leaky floating prisons. Um, and there were old Navy ships that weren't really fit for service anymore, but they, they crammed them full of convicts. And that's why they're in Admiralty records, because these are still technically uh, you know, Navy ships. And also um, convict hulks, uh, same sort of thing. These, some of these records are in Treasury. You'd be amazed what ends up in Treasury because no government department can do anything very much unless the Treasury lets it have the money. So the Treasury was always very, very interested in uh, what everything cost and what it was being spent on. And from our point of view, that has the incidental advantage that you will sometimes get things which have got lists of names because the Treasury wanted to know exactly what was being spent on this or that. Uh, and some of these are very name rich. Now, I've just, we've got records um, in home office records, which I, I skirted over a little bit. If someone was transported, they would be transported from England, so the home office would be interested. If someone was appealing against their sentence of uh, duty transportation, the appeals would be to the home office. And uh, a lot of these records are in a big collection, which is, um, is this at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, it's called Crime, Prison and Punishment Collection, and it, this consists of records from all of these um, series, from Home Office, from Admiralty, from Treasury, and, and a few others. Um, and if you, if you look at the petitions there, and, and you, can, um, you, you can filter your results or, or, or select, uh, you only want to look in the petitions, which are in a couple of series, HO 17 and 18, I think. And you will find lots and lots of people there with Irish names, and also um, whose, whose crime was committed or whose address, home address is in Ireland. So uh, although the initial court records are going to be in Ireland itself, but 
for anyone who was transported or who, met, who appealed to the Home Secretary, huge numbers of records there. And that's uh, on findmypath.co.uk because it's a British wide um, set of records. And the other one, which I haven't mentioned, but it's sitting there um, under Home Office, is a specific set of records. It only covers a five year period, but it's reports of outrages in Ireland uh, in the Home Office series, HO100. Uh, and this is um, weekly reports, county by county, parish by parish, of uh, crimes, which sometimes are really quite minor crimes, and sometimes they're um, insurrection. Um, they are now online. They've gone online within the last year or so. And this is just an example. This is one um, in, in, in a parish in Antrim where it's just a petty um, brawl, really. Someone uh, got on to just, just try to pinch somebody else's seat on a coach and try to muscle their way in and you know, fists flew. Uh, and sometimes it is relatively minor crime like this. Sometimes it's quite serious. It's um, people who burn, burn houses down. Um, the reason that these records were kept was because uh, th this, the, the authorities in Ireland um, were worried about insurrection and revolt. And this, of course, is a period just before the famine. Uh, so times were very hard. Even before the famine, times were very hard in Ireland. It was not easy to make a living. Um, so there was a lot of discontent and uh, all of these crimes were recorded, whether they were just ordinary little petty interpersonal squabbles or whether they were serious things like cattle maiming and rick burning were two of the, of the categories um, that they were listed under. So, but these are fairly ordinary, low level people, they're not the great and good and uh, that you'll find usually the name of the victim. And very often the perpetrator, even if they haven't been convicted of anything. So you get lots and lots of names, ordinary people at parish level in Ireland. The other huge series of records, which is very specifically Irish, is the Dublin Castle records. And this is the British administration, um, again, very interested in keeping tabs on nationalist organisations. Uh, and there's lots in there. We, we've got, I've got some nice examples, which unfortunately are not online for the most part. Uh, I found some lovely prisoners' letters that were smuggled out of jail in 1868, registers of suspects, um, and one box, just a single box of passport applications in 1921. And then a series which is not online, but has been catalogued uh, down to name level, and these are the, the registers for claims for compensation. Um, this is an example of a prisoner's letter. This is not the letter itself. This was what was, uh, into, the letters were intercepted. Uh, I think they were sewn into the lining of somebody's jacket, but they didn't do it very well because they were found. And then this is a copy that was made um, of the letter, and it, it's all very, very cloak and dagger. And this is a register of suspects, um, arranged alphabetically, some with photographs. I thought this was a wonderful photograph. It also looks a little bit like someone who used to work here, which amused me and my colleagues quite a lot. Um, that's only a small number. You can see it's only three pieces. It's three boxes. But um, that's a, an interesting set of records, late 19th century, when things are beginning to really hot up. Uh, passport applications, again, it's a single box. Uh, but this is a lovely um, example, again, with photographs. They've either got photographs or detailed physical descriptions. This particular one, um, his application was rejected because he was applying for a passport to go to America and the authorities noticed that um, his wife who um, and something like seven children uh, were quite unaware that he was intending to go to America. So they decided not to let him go because he would leave um, his uh, wife and children um, on the poor law authorities. But there were other people who were, who, who were sent, you know, they were allowed to go to America because they thought there'd be less trouble over there. Um, and others who were specifically not allowed to go to America because they'd probably make too much trouble there. So just a single box, but it's a wonderful set. This is um, the claims for compensation that I mentioned. There's a thing called the Irish Grants Committee. And the series is in CO762, and it's all indexed by name. Um, so if you find something on here, um, 
you can ask for a copy to be made. And these vary a lot. These are people who suffered either at the hands of the British Army or at the IRA or anyone at all during the, the troubles in the Civil War. And some of them, like this particular one, they're actually quite amusing reading. It's playing the insurance claim game where I will claim for a lot more than I've actually lost and be prepared to be um, sort of beaten down to a, a reasonable figure. And this is pretty much what this man did. Um, and, and he got about half, so he was probably fairly happy. Some of them, though, are utterly tragic because they are people whose um, cases like, you know, my, my, my son was taken out and shot, my house was burnt, my wife had a nervous breakdown. Some of them are absolutely awful. But they are all indexed by name and by place. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of information there. Uh, and this is a series I alluded to earlier, which is properly called the Irish Reproductive Loan Fund. These are on Find My Past Ireland, and it is, um, they've called it a much more sensible title, which is Poverty Relief Loans. The, there are all kinds of different documents um, in here. I picked this one because it's a particularly nice example, because it's one of those where it lists the names of people who've taken out loans, uh, and each person always had to have two neighbours or friends as guarantors, so um, you get lots and lots of personal names. And, but this is a particularly interesting one because it's, it's got a, a sort of status update. So some of these it will say, oh, that person's now died or they're still struggling or gone to America. So lots of wonderful clues about really quite ordinary people who would only be applying for one of these loans if you were a sort of fair to middling at best. Um, and it doesn't unfortunately apply to the whole of Ireland. But uh, it's a wonderful set of records, and it's well worth having a look at. Um, with Ireland, it's always a very good idea to, uh, once you know the place that your ancestors are associated with, to look and see what everybody else there is doing, uh, because the, the, the communities were very interconnected, and people would, uh, when they migrated, when they went, uh, whether they just came to England or went all the way to America, they would tend to congregate with people from their own area back home. So it's always a good idea to find out about their friends and neighbours, even if they're not actual blood relations. So that's um, one of my very favourite record sets. Um, I just want to finish with a couple of um, fairly um, commonplace records. I've already mentioned the, the, that you might find PCC wills. This is the PCC will of a, a clergyman uh, in Sligo. And I picked this pretty much at random. I was talk doing this talk for the very, very first time in Sligo. And I thought I'll find a couple of Sligo examples. And I found this. And it just so happened that someone in the audience had been researching um, Sligo churches and clergymen and hadn't um, found a will uh, for this man. Um, and it hadn't occurred to her that she should look in the PCC. Um, so that's probably the, the most ecstatic bit of feedback I've ever had, um, quite by chance. But it's a nice enough example. And if you go into the um, search for PCC wills and you put in any Irish place name, you will find lots of examples. If you put in Dublin or Belfast, you will find huge numbers. So, But anywhere else in Ireland, you never know. And this is something that you might think, why on earth am I showing you a bit of the English 1911 census? What's that got to do with Ireland? Well, quite a lot as it happens. This is the only census in anywhere in the British Isles that shows exact birthplaces in Ireland. The Irish census doesn't give you exact birthplaces. It just tells you county of birth. And much to my disappointment, the 1911 census for Scotland, which is almost identical in format to the English census, um, asks for all of the same information, except for some reason, does not ask for um, exact birthplaces in Ireland, uh, to the great disappointment of uh, very many Glaswegians who wanted to know exactly which bit of County Donegal their Irish ancestors came from. So we're doomed never to know, at least not from the census. But if you had an Irish ancestor in England who managed to still be alive in 1911, the one and only census, it gives a precise birthplace in Ireland. Um, this one is, is a, a woman who is English, and um, she's a widow, but all of her children um, 
at least three of them were, were born in Ireland, and it tells you precisely where it gives you the county and it gives you the parish, uh, which is a, a wonderful when you when you find one. Um, my guess is that she was probably married to a soldier or a sailor. She's in the Medway towns, which is always full of old soldiers and old sailors and their widows. And I just want to summarise finally the records that are online. Um, some of them are on digital downloads. And you get them direct from the National Archives website and you pay for each download. Um, this includes digital microfilm, which hasn't had the five star fully indexed treatment, but it is free to download. Most of the records, though, will be on one or other of the commercial partner sites. That is likely to be either Ancestry or Find My Past. There are some records which you'll find on both sites. Uh, for example, some of the, um, the Royal Irish Constabulary pensions are on both sites. Um, and there is also a set of records which I haven't really mentioned, but I have put it in the, the guide, which is the, the Easter Rising records. Uh, that's really about the, 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 the conduct and the, the events of the Easter Rising. It does have a lot of names in it, but it is specifically people who are involved in that. Um, but I just want to mention it now because both Ancestry and Find My Past have got large collections um, of Easter Rising records. And although there is some overlap, they have slightly different collections. So if you are interested in the Easter Rising and looking for names in it, look on both sites because they don't have exactly the same records. And wherever the record is, whether it's digital downloads or on one of the commercial sites, the access is always free here at the National Archives at Kew. And you will find you'll be able to get free access in a lot of libraries as well and um, family search centres worldwide. Um, this is a book which I found very useful. It's been out of print for a long time. Um, it's so old that it tells you whether the records you want are in Chancery Lane, which the public record office, the then public record office, vacated in 1997. Um, and it's, it's about history, not specifically genealogy. But I found an awful lot of very interesting leads in here, some of which I followed up and some of which I will get round to one day. Um, it's out of print as far as I know, but there are still copies around and it is in libraries. Um, and finally, I bet you thought I'd forgotten, but I haven't. I did mention that we've got a couple of records, some records that look as though they're Irish and they aren't very. Well, one of those was the Kilmainham uh, Army Records because it's got a very Irish name and it's the Irish establishment, but it's not necessarily Irish regiments or Irish men. And the other series is the Tontine Records. And the Tontine was just kind of like a lottery. And uh, it's an NDO, National Debt Office series. And a subset within that, the NDO3, is records of the Irish Tontine. It was, it was like the lottery. It was the way the, the government found of, of raising money. And although these ones are called the Irish Tontine records, they're not particularly Irish. The example I've got here is Irish. The way it worked, crudely speaking, is that everybody bought a ticket. And the, the last man standing, the last one to die, copped the lot. Um, the Irish tontine just meant that it was run by the, um, the Irish authorities uh, and that's where the funds went. And although you will find some Irish people in it, you'll, you'll find lots of, of, of not Irish people. And equally, you will find Irish people in the ordinary tontine records. They are not online yet, but maybe one day. Um, if we look at the progress that's been made in about the last 10 years, and then look forward to the next time. It should be fabulous. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you found that helpful.